This is the PowerPoint on the long essay um, for AP World History. And like with all the other ones, this is the new and newer version. Uh, once again, as I've said before, and I'll just keep repeating throughout the class, uh, even though we've gone through some changes in the last year, and I know we're all kind of frustrated and tired of all these changes, uh, the changes that are taking place here are minor, and they're definitely going to help you, I think, and, and make things a little bit more systematic and easier to understand for your students. Um, so hopefully this, this particular PowerPoint presentation is going to make clear what the long essay is doing now, how it's a little bit different from what it was last year, um, and give some suggestions on how to teach it to your students. So the long essay. A long essay replaces what used to be, and this was before the new framework that came out the last year, it replaces that previous free response question section. Uh, you probably remember, it hasn't been too long here, uh, the previous free response question section had a change in continuity over time and a comparison contrast essay. Students had to answer both of those. You'll probably remember, too, that when they had that, there was only a, one choice for each one of those essays. So I remember my students, whenever they would go into the test, one of their biggest worries was that they were going to face one of those questions and for some reason just wouldn't know the question, and, and then they're stuck. Good news is all that's changed. There is now going to be three choices for students. Um, all of the three choices will be around one uh, historical thinking skill. So you're either going to see all three choices around comparison contrast, change in continuity, or cause and effect. Um, so that means that whatever skill they're being challenged on, we're not going to have a differentiation between those essays each year. One year could be comparison contrast, the next one cause and effect. Here's the other great news that I'm pretty excited for. Uh, questions one, two, and three are going to cover um, all the periods that we have within AP World History. So if your students, for whatever reason, look at question one and say, oh my gosh, I do not remember the information we went over at the beginning of the year for periods one and two, well, they've got uh, question number two, periods three and four, question number three, periods five and six. And so the great news about the way that this is set up is that the students are given so many choices here with so many periods that they're really going to have to be familiar with something here, and they're going to be able to write to one of these questions. So here's what I teach my students is like a suggested template. You know, I always tell students at the beginning, you know, writing is not a science, it's not a math, you're not going to get a formula, but here are the big elements I suggest. So first off, I suggest, you know, you want to start with a thesis paragraph and get right to it on the thesis, too. Um, students get a little confused about that at the beginning of the year because, you know, in their English classes, they're taught to have a hook sentence, context, and a thesis. And I tell them, that's great. That is what a college English class is for. You're being taught to write for a college audience. Here, you're being taught to write for an audience that is college level, but is the national graders at the end of the year. They have a very specific rubric. So write to that rubric. So the very first thing is a thesis paragraph. After that, I would suggest about two to three body paragraphs. My students always ask me, you know, how many body paragraphs do you need? And at the beginning of the year, I usually tell them, hey, look, you know, um, I, I give them a page limit. And I say, you know, writing is not a science. It's not a math. So I'm not going to tell you exactly how many paragraphs you need. By the end of the year, as they get closer to the test, now I tell them, okay, look, I know what I told you at the beginning of the year. It was important for good writing skills, but now we're writing under time pressure. What I would suggest is two to three body paragraphs. The reason why is that whatever skill you're going to be asked, you're going to be able to address that skill in two body paragraphs, maybe three. That's a good kind of like rule of thumb to go by. Um, each body paragraph should have a topic sentence that addresses the historical thinking skill. I always tell my students to provide the rule of three inside of their body paragraphs. So that means three big examples in each body paragraph. And then, you know, in the past, I used to say for the conclusion, similar to the DBQ, write a synthesis statement. Uh, but since synthesis is no longer there, it leaves us open the opportunity to have a conclusion where we restate the thesis in two to three sentences, just in case they made a mistake in the thesis paragraph. So answering the prompt. This is so important. Um, and, you know, I, I, I try to make things systematic for my students, and I, I think this is really helpful to make it systematic. You know, when it comes to prompts, I would suggest that prompts really have three parts to them. The prompts have historical thinking skill, uh, there's historical content, and then there's the impact. And the way I try to use that, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do this too, is SPRITE. So that acronym of social, political, religious, ideological, technological, and economic. So like, for example, here's a prompt from a recent AP World History practice exam. Using specific examples, analyze the causes of imperial expansion and consolidation in the period 600 BC to 600 CE. Here's a great thing. They tell you what the historical skill is going to be. They put it in italics and parentheses so you know this is cause and effect. So there's your historical thinking skill. The content is about imperial expansion and consolidation. So here, you know, you're going to want to say something about what empires did in general during this time period. And the students should know this is a time period around the classical age. 
the last off is really that that impact and which one is it well in this particular case it should be pretty clear when the students interpret by the end of the year so the end of the year that this is a political impact so why is this important well you know in a lot of these prompts they'll ask about social and political effects or economic and political effects and what students oftentimes do is that they'll leave one out and if they do that they're going to lose a lot of points so i just think it's so important for the students um, to know that they should be looking for that sprite impact. So what about the rubric? Okay, so again, I apologize again. I, I know I keep saying this throughout the course. We will not have the rubrics until early August. I wish we had them earlier. But here's the good news. We can, again, take the rubrics that we already have, and we can pretty much guess at where they're going to be coming from because the changes have been so minor. Um, so we're just looking now to early August to see if they've changed the point levels or how they've worded things differently. But overall, I think it's going to be pretty much the same. Your thesis gets one point. You then have to address the historical thinking skill for two points. That means using the skill is one point. Providing explanation for the skill is another point. Your evidence, you need to provide relevant evidence, one point, and explain the evidence, one point. And for me, I always tell the students, you know, in every body paragraph, I want them to hit rule of three. Um, I explain to them that it's really not a rule, it's more of a guideline. So, you know, if they have a body paragraph that has two examples, that's okay. Um, but I want them to try and hit three. In the end, what I always put as my bar that they have to hit is five specific examples throughout the essay. Why do I do that? Um, I'm a grader at the AP grading, and I find overall, most of the time, five specific examples are the amount. There are some years when that changes. Sometimes it's a little bit more than that. But, you know, the years when it's like that, it's... It's more that they'll ask for a list of evidence and they'll count just basic details as evidence. And if that happens, if you're providing five specific examples that are well described, you're gonna, you're gonna be fine um, answering the amount of evidence that's needed. So what are the changes that we're seeing taking place? Well, similar to what we've talked about before, there is no longer a synthesis skill, that's out. There is also no longer a periodization essay. So now we have narrowed down the cause and effect essays. It's very clear. Also, the students will now have that choice, which I think makes it so much easier for them because if they mess up on one time period, they're going to have two other time periods to choose from. So it really, I, I think it just makes it a lot easier for them to strategically attack this essay and, and be able to answer one of the particular questions that's asked. So this gets to the grading itself, and I wanted to take a little bit of time in this PowerPoint to talk about this. I know as AP World History graders, we're pretty familiar at this point, unless you're new to the class, with the type of grading we do, but I wanted to talk a little bit about it because I think it's so important um, to understand like what's the difference between the different grading styles. So I'm an AP US history teacher and grader as, well, I used to be an AP US history grader. Um, now I'm an AP world history teacher and grader. Um, and so I've seen both styles of grading and they both have their upsides and their downsides. Um, for AP US history teachers, what they used to do is called holistic grading, which was based on an overall assessment of historical thinking skills and content used to be the approach for AP US history teachers and graders, and the advantage was that it gave the teachers the discretion to award or critique an essay based upon their overall judgment. What I loved about this approach, still do, is that it really allows teachers to sort of take off the handicaps. So the teachers now are allowed to make judgments based upon their overall skill levels. And you know, most of us understand essay writing is an art. Essay writing is organic. And we know, English teachers know too, that it's very hard to break an essay down and say, you know, what are the, the, the skills that we can quantify? Because we know in the end that even if we do that, that there still is something overall about an essay that we can say, wow, that's an essay that really goes into depth. There's an art to that essay. So the disadvantage, I think, though, to the holistic style is that oftentimes students don't have a clear sense about what it takes to hit that higher level. Um, because really it is about a subjective judgment on the side of a teacher. So AP World History has for a long time done what's called asset grading, or now it's called dimensional scoring. Dimensional scoring means that we take skills and we measure them by numerical evaluations, or we weight them. This is really a continuation of the older AP World History style that was called asset scoring that we used to do for the old test. Um, the advantage to this one, I think, and I do really think there's an advantage. I mean, I, I love this type of scoring because it really provides a quantifiable and consistent form of evaluation. You know, we really can get more of a sense of, you know, if you hit this skill, you get this amount of points, and, and here's what it takes to get there. The disadvantage, I think, is that it loses a certain amount of organic or artistic evaluations of essays. You know, even if we do give points to skills in the end, you know, the real big question is, okay, well, sometimes they're people hit skills better than they hit them on at other times. And I can't tell you how many times I've had students who have who've said to me, hey, I did everything you said in the definition of that skill. Why didn't I get the point? And, and it's like, yeah, you did what I said, but you didn't do it at a level that really deserved the points. 
And so the really, I think the hard part is, you know, how do you deal with this, with the upside downside of these two types of grading? So here's what I've done in my classroom, and it's up to you how you want to approach this. I know some students, some teachers want to just grade the way AP grades, and, and we're done. And, and that's the way it gets ready for the test. Makes perfect sense. And that's fine. If you want to grade that way, it works out very well. I know a lot of successful teachers who do that, and it's very clear to students. Makes perfect sense to me to do that uh, type of thing. For me personally, I feel, you know, the class is more than just the test at the end of the year. The class is about teaching students how to get ready for college. The class is about how to make them into better students. The class is, is about how to teach them to be better writers, better thinkers, uh, better debaters, better discussers in the class. And so for me, I feel that I have the freedom, and I think most teachers feel this way, to take what the College Board gives us, say that's good stuff, now we're going to add on our own things to make it even better. And so what I do is that I combine. Uh, the dimensional scoring to me is, is benchmarks. These are the basic things I know students have to hit. However, I get to define and I get to make the judgment on whether or not the students have hit that. So I'll tell the students at the beginning of the year, you know, here are the guidelines for hitting this, but please do understand that there are going to be times where I'm going to make a judgment on whether or not you hit the definition of, of what's needed here, and you may not. And in fact, my rubrics are set up in such a way that the students can either be below the skill and need to do better, they can hit the standard of the skill, or they go beyond the skill. And, and so I have a way to then provide that sort of evaluative judgment uh, to them uh, that includes both, I think, the objective side of dimensional scoring and the subjective side of holistic scoring. But then the holistic side of it really now is for each one of those um, particular scores. So some takeaways here. I think are really good for us to remember off this. This is great news to me. Students now have three choices from all the possible periods in AP World History to answer the long essay. So if they mess up on one, they're definitely going to know about one of the other ones. And I think that really is going to be helpful for your students. Uh, the other thing really important to me in all the arguments, the three components, historical thinking skill, content, and sprite impact. And then last up, please remember that you know rubrics are based upon quantitative benchmarks, but you retain as the teacher the discretion to determine if a student is hitting that level. And I think as long as you're clear about that with the students at the beginning of the year and you provide them with a clear definition, you provide them with a way to hit it, you know, make sure that they do rough drafts, make sure they do peer edits, make sure that you give them comments and, and help throughout the year. Um, I think you have the discretion to make these judgments and you shouldn't be held, um, made to feel like you were held uh, to these absolute rubrics from the College Board, you are teaching these students how to be better writers, not how just to do excellently on the national exam, which, by the way, I think is very important, and I think that national exam does a great job of evaluating students, but I, I still think in the end that we do more than that, and you do more than that as a teacher, and you should feel the freedom to do more than that. Remember, in the end, you're teaching these kids how to be great writers, so take that freedom and, and be confident in that and know that you can combine uh, your best ways of evaluating with what's there in the College Board rubrics.